The Land of Amory by Jonathan McTemis. This is an audio companion to the article that can be found at obryproject.info. That is O B R Y P R O J E K T dot I N F O on the resources page. Currently, video resources are available at both the Obri Project Bit Shoot page and the Jonathan McTemis YouTube channel. That is M A C H T E M E S. Note to the reader slash listener. Due to the nature of the task ahead of us concerning Obri, many of the proper nouns many may be familiar with from the established translations have been presented either in Obri from left to right with their Strong's number or phonetically based on the best possible rendering of the Obri into English. In the last article, the patriarchs, their livestock, the land, the burden of presenting the material along with the coded obri, was obviously very heavy. If it seemed acceptable to just present the popular renderings of these proper nouns, that is what would have been done. However, besides the outright changing of various peoples and places by nearly all translations, even the phonetic renderings are either based on the Masoretic or on factors entirely without any textual merit. It is this author's hope that this continual insistence on either the true source words or at least close phonetic renderings will lead to a wider degree of dissatisfaction with all of the dominant translations based on either a Masoretic or Greek dictation of proper nouns. An interesting coincidence. I once called the Japanese Asian, which they didn't like very much. They said, there are lots of Asians. I'm not Indian or Iraqi. I'm from Japan. This specificity of location and race is a point of contention for many, most in fact. I understand. Given the diverse nature of peoples from one so-called continent, even Europe, where it is said is the ancestral home of my people, Germans. There's wide diversity between Swedes and Spaniards. A Slav would not care to be called a Celt and vice versa. But to identify a people with a land is necessary. Categorization is just a tool for specificity and identification. It's what separates the Indians from the Indians, the Georgians from the Georgians, and the Canaanites from the Palestinians. Let's take a hypothetical scenario, which has, in fact, happened. There is a land in which ten different kinds of people live. A couple of these people have relatives that traveled abroad and found places with the same name as where they were from. Let's call one of these people the Who's. If a merchant wanted his ship to sail to the land of the Who and buy three tons of sugar, but didn't specify to his skipper which Who, he could have a very bad year. One Who people live in the land of Red named after another people there, because of their proliferation and early trading. The other who live in the land of blue, also named for a certain people. Now, the merchant can command, go to the land of red, to the people of who. This will then get his ship to the right place. So even though I'm a Hoosier, in a broader sense, I'm an American, and that's the name of the broader land that I live in. If I want to receive my mail, say in Hebron, I'd better make sure the return address indicates Hebron, capital I, lowercase n, lowercase d. No, the three-letter designation with no zip code wasn't a mistake. And not Hebron, Palestine. A broader designation, then, is always necessary in helping the seeker to find the right place. Eschatologically, even the least educated Christian knows there's something to the people being reunited with the land, or Israel 
being brought back to the land promised to Abram as a perpetual possession for his seed through Yitzhak. In fact, many Zionists support the efforts of the Jews and their illegal settlements and aggression towards the Palestinians because of the overwhelming number of Bible passages referring to Israel being put out of the land for so long and returning to inhabit and, quote, rebuild the waste places, unquote, as it were. They do not realize that, quote, a land without a people for a people without a land, unquote, was and is utter nonsense. It was contrived by the same people who owned the shipping companies that brought mostly whites and sparse blacks to the new world, in quotes. A land that truly was so devoid of a population to fill its spaces that we still are far, far away from accomplishing that to this day. There does, however, remain a stark eschatology that demands the people be returned to the land. Quote, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Hosea 1 verse 10. Quote, in the place, unquote, is Makum, Strong's 4725, as in the same location. There is a very real geographical aspect to end times prophecies. Of course, most have been convinced that Palestine and the Middle East is the obvious location for the events described in the Bible. But as many have already seen in my article and video, The Patriarchs, Their Livestock, The Land, and as you will witness in many articles to come, well, if the glove doesn't fit, it ain't legit. What about all those Babylonian and Assyrian artifacts? What about the Merneptah Stella? What about all the artifacts around Palestine and Egypt? I say, what about all the Hebrew, Roman, Egyptian, Phoenician, in quotes, Greek and Ptolemaic artifacts, archaeological locations, giant skeletons, sometimes in full armor, earthworks, and still standing ruins in America that are often either covered up, declared off limits, destroyed or lost by the Smithsonian, or attested as fakes by, in my opinion, the most shady of characters. There are two infractions that will get any case thrown out of court, murder, extortion, or otherwise. One is planting evidence, and the other is destroying evidence. Interesting, the sorts of people and their affiliations who've hit pay dirt in the Middle East, while the feds and UNESCO are making it a crime to even go near many sites in North America, and what isn't barred from search and discovery via the national parks has often been declared native land, or is deemed off-limits by force. I'll readily admit, it certainly seems they are pulling a whole lot of evidence out of the ground over there. But what I can't seem to find in all my extensive searching is scripture to back their stories up. It amazes me how many people would prefer to accept the evidence of the same sorts of people with the same sorts of connections that brought many of the whites to North America as slaves, hooked half of China on opium, and are doing the same to white countries today, have been the source of usurious banks the world over, popularized communism, and control most film studios, publishers, and news sources, in quotes. Is it possible that this monolith could craft a story through a multi-tiered propaganda campaign that might fool the world? 
any student of revisionist history knows this is not only possible, but it's been done in spades. Because we know we've been fooled in more ways than have even yet been accounted for, it is an encumbrance upon those who love the truth to question the entire secular narrative. This article, like my last, was precipitated by a seemingly insignificant bit of information that didn't seem to fit the rest of the text. I've now come to realize that this sort of thing is never a mistake, but is always quite deliberate on behalf of him who inspired the text itself. While writing my last article, I came across this, Genesis 15, 16, and this is my translation, quote, Your seed will return in the fourth revolution, as the iniquity of the Amory is not yet full, unquote. Ah, so he means the people of the fourth son of Canaan or Canaan? Well, yes, but that's not all. In verses 19 through 21, we see a list of ten peoples dwelling in the land just promised to Abram. All these various peoples would be marked for eviction. Perhaps, I thought, the Amory were just worse than the others and I could have let it alone until I went back to working on my nations-slash-lands table. In the course of recording all pertinent geographical information about the Amory, I came to Genesis 48.22, which required its own appendix entry. According to the KJV, this verse reads, quote, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. The NASB renders it exactly the same. These are the two translations coded to Strong's. Strong's, a tool nearly as misleading as the two aforementioned translations and definitely as complicit, lists the appearance of Shechem here as H. 7926, which is blatantly misleading and baseless from a textual critic's viewpoint. There is only one incidence wherein Eokab Jacob gains land through violence. It is the matter of Dina, his young daughter, found in Genesis 34. A careful reading of the events in Genesis 34 will reveal that not only was this land called Shechem, but the inhabitants were Hui, or Hivites. The proper Strong's listing would be H7927, as even many other newer translations have rendered it. But again, for the purposes of this article, we need to ask the question, why? are the Hui Hivites being called Amory or Amorites. This was once again the oddity I was presented with. Now, a one-off is a shrug of the shoulders. A two-off is enough to raise a very real suspicion. How about three? Okay, let's do three. The first chapter of Deuteronomy or Debarim recounts the events of the previous decades of Yisrael's time in the Midbar, or wild. Verse 144 reads, quote, And the Amorites, which dwelt in that mountain, came out against you, and chased you, as bees do, and destroyed you in Sire, even unto Horma, unquote. So they were defeated by the Amory. What's to see here? Well, Thank you, TSK cross-reference. Even if one isn't doing a thorough concordance search, the TSK cross-reference, found in many Bible softwares, will show other verses with pertinence to the one you are currently on. The TSK will offer Numbers 14.45, quote, Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them and discomfited them, even unto Horma, 
unquote. So now we see the Omlaki, or Amalekites, and the Canoni, or Canaanites, being referred to as Amory, or Amorites. I'm going to now have to quote a law that unfortunately many Bible expositors and apologists don't clarify as to its context. It's important to do so here. In the case of a capital offense, one witness could not seal the fate of another. If it were murder, the alleged murderer could not be condemned by only one witness. I'm using this quote because of the gravity of these matters and the theory I will be supporting before this article is done. Deuteronomy 19.15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. This is echoed and put into practice many times in both the Old Testament and New. It is a good guide to proving a matter, any matter scripturally, since all scriptural matters are important, and scripture is not subject to any private interpretation. At this point, I would boldly say there is enough proof of Amory as a secondary descriptive to say it is quite likely that it was intended to be seen by us, or far later generations, like, quote, Hebron, Indiana, USA. Even the Canoni, or Canaanites, are called Amory. Yes, the Canoni, as in the land of Canaan. Those Canaanites are assigned the broader term of Amorite, Amory. But for those who just won't hear it from three witnesses, I ask this Will you hear it from 16 witnesses? Yes, that's correct. I said 16 witnesses. For those who struggle with math, that's five times more witnesses than I've just revealed, plus one. So, now that you've heard my mouth, here's the money. Witness number four, Deuteronomy 4, 47. And they possessed his land the land of Og, king of Bashan, two kings of the Amorites, which were on this side Jordan, towards the sun rising. Are we talking about Og, king of Bashan, of the remnant of Repaim or Rephaim? The one from Deuteronomy 3.11, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. That Og? Is it just an anomaly? that he is called an Amory king? Because passages like Numbers 32-33, Deuteronomy 1-4, and 1 Kings 4-19, and Psalms 136-19-20 distinguish Sihun, king of the Amory, from Og, king of Bashan. But yet he is called an Amory king in Deuteronomy 4.47, Deuteronomy 31.4, Joshua 2.10, Joshua 9.10, etc. Isn't the land he reigned over called Eretz Repaim, land of the giants, like in Deuteronomy 3.13? Which is he, a Rephaim or an Amorite? The answer is yes. What are you, a Parisian or a Frenchman? Indeed. The naysayer, quote, Og was a Rephaim, but was just a king over the Amorites. Well, remember the other Amory king, Sahun? Did you know he ruled over the Midianites, Joshua 13, 21, or that he took his lands and cities from the Moabites, Numbers 21, 26 through 29? If Sehun was an Amory with Medini or Midianite princes who ruled over Moabi or Moabite peoples, why isn't he called a king of the Moabites? It's all right, though. We have 12 more to go. 
Witness number five, Joshua ten five. Quote, Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites. Unquote. This is a list of five kings called Amory. Their names are currently inconsequential, and the last three have no additional textual support of them being anything other than Amory by tribe. It's the first two to take note of the king of Jerusalem or Jerusalem and the king of Hebron or Hebron. These are quite clearly called, quote, kings of the Amory. However, according to Joshua 15.63.18.28, Judges 121.19.10, and 2 Samuel 5.6, 1 Chronicles 11.4, the Yebusi or Jebusites are the inhabitants of this city. In fact, its name is Jibus before it's fully taken over, Judges 19.10. Hebron, or Habron, is interesting and a bit complex, but we'll sort it out. Genesis 13.18 tells us that Alni Mamre is Habron, or the slopes of Mamre is Habron. Genesis 14.13 reads, Alni Mamre, the Amory, thus calling Mumra an Amory. Perhaps that's just the tribe, but not so fast. In Genesis 23, when Abram needs to purchase land for burial purposes, he has to meet with the sons of Heth, or the Hethi, translated Hittites, and purchase land from them. These Hathi know and respect him, in verse 10, they're meeting in the gate of the city. This is where administrative matters are settled. The parcel he buys adjoins the slopes of Mamre, from verse 17. If the tribes of the Hathi and Amri both lived there, where were the Amri? Abram had a covenant with three Amri, including Mamre as per Genesis 14, 13. Why not go to them? He did go to them. They were tribally Hathi, and in a broader sense, Amory. No? Well, here's the thing. While they are in Mitzrim, this once Hathi-dominated city becomes Kareth Arbo, from Joshua 14.15 and Genesis 23.1. It is built by the sons of Onak. The Onakim were giants and were unchallenged, Deuteronomy 9.2. So, as per Joshua 11.21, Habrun, or Kareth Arbo, was an Anakim city, correct? Yes. And as per Joshua 10.5, it is an Amory city. Are we seeing a pattern yet? A Nova Scotian is a Canadian. A Berliner is a German. A Pekingese or Beijing is Chinese. And so on. No? No problem. Witness number six. Joshua 24, 15. Or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Be careful to read the whole chapter up until that point, and pay attention to all the various peoples listed, including the tribe of the Amory. But what if in this verse he is talking about just the gods of the Amory? Deuteronomy 20:17 through 18 makes that quite unlikely. Quote, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as Yahweh thy Alayim hath commanded thee, that they teach you not to do after their abominations, which they have done unto their gods. So should ye sin against Yahweh your Alayim. This is echoed in Deuteronomy 7, 1-5, and 12:30, 30, 
or Exodus 23, 28 through 33, and many others. All these nations had various gods. Many of these nations are listed before verse 15 of Joshua 24, but the text blankets, quote, the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Witness number 7. Judges 136. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim, from the rock and upward. Coast is better translated border, from Gabul 1366. Besides the fact that two verses prior, we see the Amory driving Dan into the mountains and would not let them dwell in the valley, even though Numbers 13.29 tells us the Amory dwell in the mountains and the Omlaki dwell in the south. This passage cites a place at the southern extremity of Yisrael's new territory and, quite mechanically, states the Amory's border was from that point up. There were many various peoples dispossessed from that point up. Witness number 8, Judges 6, 9 and 10. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Mitzri and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. This, of course, harkens back to the initial prophecy to Abraham in Genesis 15, 13, and 14. Quote, and he said unto him, Abram, know of a surety, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. The all that oppressed you part, remember, includes the land of Canaan before Mitzrim. They were only in hard bondage in Mitzrim the last half of their time there, which was only about two centuries, their time there. Again, as before, there were many peoples and many gods, but here they are directed to not fear the gods of the Amory, in whose land you dwell. Check the source text. That translation is very accurate. Everywhere Yisrael dwells at this point is the land of the Amory. Witness number 9, Judges 10.8 And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. I'm certainly surprised that this area is called, quote, the land of the Amory, as the sons of Yisrael had taken it more than 300 years prior. If you look at the source wording, a translation more like, quote, the land of the Amory in Galod. This is most likely a specificity separating it from the Galod on the other side of the Yardan. However, it's very easy to do this without including a people that hadn't controlled that area for over three centuries. Not the strongest point, but worth taking note of. We have seven yet to go. Witness number 10. 1 Samuel 7.14 And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even unto Gath, and the coasts thereof did Israel deliver 
out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Wait, back up. There was peace with the Amory once they had retaken control of all the Palshathim cities? The Amory haven't even been mentioned since Judges 11.9, and that being in a retelling of the final events of the Exodus. Before that, it was Judges 10.8, which we just covered. In fact, not even a scuffle with the Amory is recorded since Judges 1, and that's about four centuries prior. Everything surrounding the above passage from 1 Samuel is about the Pelshathim, who Yisrael have been fighting with almost exclusively for a century. They had peace with the Amory Pelshathim, like the South African Zulu or the South American Portuguese. The truth is, the tribe of the Amory have been so absent from the narrative that they aren't even the subject of our next entry. Witness number 11, 2 Samuel 21, 2. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. This story goes back to the time when Yisrael had first come into the land. The men of Gabon, 1391, which is translated Gibeonite, had deceived the princes of Yisrael to strike a covenant with them. When Yusho found out about their deceit, he told them, quote, Now therefore ye are cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. Joshua 9.23 So after the sons of Israel defeated the Amory kings, who by tribe weren't Amory, <laughs> In Joshua 10, Joshua 11:19 reads, quote, There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all other they took in battle. So who were the men of Gabun, or Gibeon? The remnant of the Amory. They were Hui, or Hivites, which made what Shaul did to them a breach of a long-standing covenant and persuaded Duid, or David, to resolve it in the manner with which he did. They were Amory Hui, like the Swedish Arabs, or Roman Swiss Guard. Witness number 12. 1 Kings 21-26 And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom Yahweh cast out before the children of Israel. This, of course, bears resemblance to Judges 6, 9, and 10 and the crossed references to that verse. Remember, even 1 Kings 9-20 lets us know the Amory as a tribe are still around. But once again, 1 Kings 21-26 uses Amory as a broad term to cover many peoples. Is it strange that a whole land and various peoples would be called by the name of one tribe? Have you heard of England? Did you know the Franks were one tribe who occupied parts of France? And don't even get me started on Saudi Arabia. Witness number 13. 2 Kings 2111. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Yes, 
This is material which echoes some of what we've already witnessed. However, when building a sound and honest case, no evidence should go ignored. In fact, this truly is a pattern of noteworthiness. We again have seen nothing of the Amory as a tribe in over five centuries. They are listed as tribes remaining in Solomon or Shalmay's empire or time among the sons of Canaan, but they have gotten no records of note written about them other than their name used as a broad sweeping term concerning the non-Israelite people of the land. Like if I said, like all the Africans which were before him, or like all the Europeans which were before him. The Bengalis are one group of people in Bangladesh. Its tribes also include the Chakma, Marma, Tripura, Tenkengya, Kumi, Moro, Lushai, Kiang, Bauman Panku, and Chak. There are many stories about how a land and its residents acquired its name. Some are more believable than others. Sometimes all that's needed is for a popular source of records to deem a land, quote, the land of blank. Unquote, and it sticks. This happens quite often. Witness number 14, Ezekiel 16, 3 and 45. 3. And say, Thus saith the Adani Alayim unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. And verse 45, Thou art thy mother's daughter, that loatheth her husband and her children, and thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite, and your father an Amorite. These two passages denouncing Jerusalem or Jerusalem for her whoredom is using tribal specifications. It seems to me that the speaker, being Yahweh, is equating the tribe of Yehuda or Judah with the tribes mentioned, quote, of the land of Canaan. The vast majority of tribes in this land were of the seed of Canaan. Quote, your nativity. Jerusalem wasn't born to the land of Israel, Judah, or Benjamin, it was born to a Canaanite. It was being said to still be a Canaanite. Its parentage, though, is of interest to us here. Quote, your mother was an Hathi, or Hittite, and your father was an Amri, or Amorite. Has no basis in the records of inhabitants of Jerusalem. If one wishes to equate Shelem, Strong's 8004, with Jerusalem, Strong's 3389, then the earliest inhabitants we know of are the Hui, or Hivite, and the most prolific tribe associated with Jerusalem are the Yabusi, Strong's 2982. Speculation can go on forever on why the Hathi for maternity and Amory for patronage, and I don't think any side would gain significant ground. However, one fact is clear. A Jebusite city, with arguably no other historical inhabitant than maybe the Hivite from Genesis 33.18, is said to have an Amorite as its father. If this were isolated, one may wonder why. But when seen in context with all the passages that deem various inhabitants of the land as Amory, and the land itself as Eretz Amory, it becomes more clarified. The paternity used here cannot be arbitrary. Witness number 15, Amos 2.9 Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, 
whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above, and his roots from beneath. I don't know if Erezim, strong 730, which is the word translated as cedar, should be cedar, or another species, but I do know this is saying these people were giants. The Amory or Amorites, however, as a specific tribe from Canon, were not giants. Repaim or Rephaim were, and the Onakim or Anakim were. And I may have missed any other giant people like the Amims or Zamzamims, which Israel never dealt with. But the Amory, as in the sons of Canon, were not giants. The giants who Yahweh expelled are being blanketed as Amory. This is because they were Amory, just as Og of Bashan, as the sons of Anak of Hebron, as the remnants of Anak among the Philistines. The giants of the land called Amory are Amory giants. Witness 16, Amos 2.10 Also, I brought you up from the land of Mitzrim and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. This is just a great passage illustrating what's going on here. Does anyone remember that from the time Yisrael took the kingdom away from Sihun and Og, their expansion covered so much land at the time of Duid and Shalmei, or David and Solomon, that the peoples they either encompassed or displaced was at least in the dozens. Yet, many years afterward, the prophet Amos, speaking for Yahweh, says that they were to possess the land of the Amory, not the land of all the various peoples whose land they did, in fact, possess, the land of the Amory. Genesis 15, 18, quote, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Mitzrim, unto the great river, the river Parath. In whose land? Amory land. Genesis 26, 4, And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Which countries slash lands? Amory countries slash lands. Deuteronomy 7, 1, when Yahweh thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Which nations? Amory nations. Every nation or people within the boundaries of the land taken are, according to the living God, Amory. And your point is, for starters, if the following 16 points have failed to convince you that at least the God of the Bible prefers the blanket term Amory or Amorite for the land of and the people of quote, the promised land, I'd conclude that objective evidence and sober facts aren't really your style. One must also be cognizant of names of places being established very early. Genesis 10 early. Quote, by these were the isles of the nations divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Genesis 10, 5. Genesis 10, 20 and 31 echo as much concerning Ham and Shem. The Bible routinely refers to the nations and locations of the world based on names of the sons and grandsons of these three Noadic or Nahi patriarchs. 
As late as Ezekiel 38, we see the names of nations and peoples. Magog, Meshech, Tubal, Gomer, all sons of Japheth. Cush, Put, sons of Ham. Tagarma, Tarshish, grandsons of Japheth. Sheba, Dedan, great-grandsons of Ham. This is not a few exceptions, but the rule. Run cross-reference searches on all the names mentioned in Genesis 10. You'll see that just as it's written for each of the three houses, the nations, peoples, and lands were, for the most part, named according to these early Nahi generations. Incidentally, I can't say enough bad things about the translations of these names and their inconsistencies, which anyone will see upon performing the aforementioned search. What you will find is twofold. One, you'll find that these early descendants' names stick for the whole of the Obri, or Hebrew, record. And two, many of the original Obri names of nations and peoples have either been phonetically distorted or outright changed in modern translations. Examples. <clears throat> Canon, altered to Canaan. Hui, altered to Hivite. Rephaim, altered to Rephaim and or embalmer, and or medicine, and or dead. Tzedon, altered to Sidon or Zidon. Pelshathim, altered to Philistines, today incorrectly seen as the Palestinians. The Arm Nerim, outright changed to Mesopotamia. Ashur, altered to Assyria, Thrush Ish, altered to Tarshish, and I suspect altered again to Tarsus in the New Testament Greek. Iun, outright changed to Greece. Mitzrim, outright changed to Egypt. Arm, outright changed to Syria. Porus E, outright changed to Persian. Now this is one of my personal favorites. Labi and Puti, two distinct people slash places, both altered, both appearing as Libya at some point. Both cannot be Libya, unless Nahum 3.9 ought to read, quote, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Libya and Libya were thy helpers. And that was with Lubim changed to Libya, as they are represented as Libya in Daniel 11.43. Note, none of the nations listed in Nahum 3.9 are correct renderings. <laughs> Thanks, King James. But he did get a lot of help from influential friends. But... I digress. Even though the world as we know it has undergone a massive identity shift sometime in its past, we see the Bible affirming that the names of many places were attributed to the second to fourth generations from Noah. Our knowledge of these ancient people and places is key in our understanding of eschatology. Not many clues yet remain, so we need to do our due diligence in giving attention to what clues we have. It's my firm belief that in time, I and others like myself will amass such a body of conclusive evidence against the current popular model, location, and people of biblical events that it will be undeniable that someone has tampered with not only the record, but with the nature of reality itself. My hope is to point all of those drawn to this area of study in the right direction, to the land of milk and honey, a broad land and a good land, a land promised to Abram's seed forever and given to the sons of Yisrael on condition. 
the world will eventually be forced to look far and wide from the Middle East for the location of the Bible. Some already have. I, like many others, began in Africa, moved about Asia and Europe, considered Australia and various large islands, pondered the extreme north, but have now settled in America, North America, to be exact. Final section, the New World. It ought to appear as an absurdity that the Americas are a gaping black hole in the construct of accepted history. From at least the time of Solomon, empires were sailing the world, and the fact is, no one can sail the world and miss the Americas. It strikes me as dreadfully unfortunate that the great libraries of the world suffered disaster. If only the Vatican were to open up her vaults to the good of mankind. I've got a feeling if they ever did, all the right documents would be sadly absent by then. And we can't just kick the Vatican around. I believe one of the most guarded treasures in the world are the documents in various private collections and in government vaults revealing the true history of the land of my birth. Much like its vacuous history, no one has a satisfactory explanation of how the land of my own nativity came about its name. With all the controversy and contrived stories, I think it will be a matter that will need to be settled as part of a larger set of data, a preponderance of evidence. Some choose to believe the Amerigo Vespucci tale, even though it seems his name wasn't altered to Amerigo until after various maps and letters with the name America were created. Some choose to go the land of the plumed serpent root, as in the Peruvian god Amaru. This doesn't explain how a Peruvian god had enough influence to get two continents named after him, or how Europeans found out about this mighty Peruvian deity. Others say the name may have derived from a Nicaraguan mountain range, the Amarisk Mountains said to be derived from the Mayan word or words meaning, quote, the country of the wind, or the country where the wind blows constantly. With all of this intriguing speculation, I'd like to throw in my own theory. At one time, in the history of most of the world, both Latin and Greek were at least very close to being universal languages. Both of these languages have had a marked effect on the current place names we know. The Latin suffix icus, I-C-U-S, is said to be a successor of the Greek icos, I-K-O-S. These are both English phonetic translation. And no matter if the masculine, feminine, or neutral is employed, they turn out a similar form. Icus, Icum, Ica, or Ica. These two languages are said to be like English, having a simple lettered alphabet with combinations rendering phonetic results which have been assigned a meaning at various times and in various ways. Place names the world over still bear remnants of these common Latin slash Greek suffixes. When looking up the etymology of Africa, for example, some say its root was Afri, A-F-R-I, after a local tribe, with a later I-C-A suffix that stuck. Some say Afrique, A-P-H-R-I-K-E, from the Greek meaning without cold. Others say it's from the Latin aprica, A-P-R-I-C-A, meaning sunny. If these were the case, I'd expect either A-P-H-R or A-P-R to be the root, 
But what is the proof of their respective origins? Remember, any language without inherent meaning to the character or letter leaves the observer or reader at the mercy of any given lexicographer. AMR, or AMR, could be phonetically presented as AMAR, AMER, AMIR, AMOR, AMUR, and still be AMR, by either early or later languages to bridge the consonantal gap. And since there is such a blackout of this sort of information pre-1500 AD, who's to say? Depending on the context, many places retained names with various forms of the ikus or ikus suffix. Sometimes a place or thing can be heard or seen in a certain form, so often it sticks. Even the experts don't have the answers to why many various place names ended up with various forms of the icus or icos suffix. There's a great deal of conjecture out there. Nevertheless, many places still retain their icus, icum, ica, ia, and a suffixes with etymologies and excuses out the well, there's no shortage. From all I've witnessed concerning these fiat languages and the absurdity of believing man could be sailing the seas without a good knowledge of the Americas, along with all of the biblical passages I've provided at the start, I'm asserting that the land known as that of the Amr, A-M-R, would become the Amr, A-M-E-R, and as it was pertaining to the Amr, A-M-E-R, it would likely get the feminine I-C-A to remain static as there are many bridges in the handing down of languages that can cause the feminine I-C-A to stick, like we see even with the Spanish suffix in Mexico, thus becoming America, which was never the New World, as it's perceived by most today, but a land that sat in ruin for many generations, awaiting the time when the children of Israel would be returned. Eventually, there are two questions that will need to be dealt with. One, why doesn't Palestine and the Middle East work? And two, why does there seem to be a great gaping void where the Americas should be in history. By now I'm quite sure that a full barrage of questions, conceptions, and conundrums are spinning through the listener's head faster than they can keep up with. I say don't worry, there will be more. The one thing that has no fear of scrutiny is the truth. I've been suspicious of America's origins for some time, but was in no hurry to publish any theories until this Amory puzzle was brought to my attention. The more empathetic part of me wants to soothe the troubled mind of those whose cognitive dissidence is running wild on them at this moment by saying, Don't worry. It's just one thing, you know. Who knows where it'll go from here? But I know better. The truth is, before this Amory question was revealed to me, I already had a very bulky list of items linking America to the Bible. But what if you're wrong, you may ask? That part is easy. I simply admit my error and move forward. Simple, relatively painless, perhaps relieving. The real hard part the possibility rife with a lack of ease and comfort, the remarkably painful, woefully fragile, and wonderfully horrifying option is not, what if I'm wrong? The truly difficult part of all of this? 
is what if I'm right? Be sure and visit obreproject.info and may the truth win out in the end.